Hello, it's now 7.24 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 2.22.2019, I guess. And I'm starting a little later today because, eh, you don't want to hear it. Hey, listen, I was going to uh, tell everybody, uh, I'm sorry, it, I caught myself yesterday, I think it was, um, my runny nose. Good night. In the morning, I don't know what it is. I think it's because it got, we got block walls in the house, and which is, I don't think it's a great uh, design idea. It's a straight block. So from exterior to interior with very little to no <laughs> insulation outside of it. Uh, and, and though air pockets, like if you built a... Uh, an exterior brick portion of a wall with an air pocket in it. That's really good for insulation. But just straight block like that, no, because it's going to conduct the cold right inside. And if you don't have enough insulation either in or out, boy, is it cold near one. And the house isn't big, so you're almost always near an, an outside wall. <laughs> unless, unless you're in the heart of the house. You want to spend all day in the bathroom, maybe. Um, so yeah, my nose runs like Eric Liddell, and uh, I try to keep it from, you know, and I try to keep from sniffing into the microphone, try to catch myself, sometimes I don't. So now, uh, this is this is part five on Joe Smith and the Kabbalah, and I'll be 100% uh, honest with you, I didn't know that it was going to take take five, and it's going to take more than five, and uh, I didn't start out with uh, the intention of spending as much time on some of those uh, those sections, you know, as I went. But the, the second time through of reading them, I started to realize that there is, there is an importance to at least hit on portions of those sections and um, provide a bit of commentary, commentary because something I saw is just this consistent vein, of course, running throughout. There is nothing new under the sun. So if you can see uh, that common vein, just like the author Lance Owens does, because he, he continually, in each section, no matter what we're talking about, he is, is pretty easily able to just draw your attention back to Kabbalah. And here we have this expression of this, and although, boom, back, Kabbalistic back it's Kabbalistic. Now I never had any desire to read any portions of Kabbalah necessarily. Um, some might be necessary. You, you've got why? Well you if you're gonna spot first off you're gonna spot a counterfeit uh, or if you're going to be investigating claims like this made, you've got to get somewhat familiar with certain materials. I mean, it's the same thing with Talmud. The last thing I want to do is expose my mind to much of uh, what's in the Talmud, but uh, sometimes it's just necessary uh, as a means to an end. Okay, so anyways, uh, that's that. So we, I am going to spend probably a little more time in the text uh, of the article because of where we're at now, because at this point he's getting us a lot closer to Joe Smith, um, and this is the stuff that gets really important, and it allows us to uh, see a, a pretty far beyond uh, the article. So he says in the section on Hermeticism in the Magic Worldview, a decade ago, Mormon historians were forced to confront the subject of Joseph Smith and the occult or magic worldview, a confrontation caused in part by the discovery, in quotes, of the so-called Salamander letter, replete with references to seer stones, treasuries, and enchantments. The letter also related that Joseph Smith obtained the Book of Mormon not from an angel, but from a magical white salamander, which transfigured itself into a spirit. Though the letter was subsequently proved a forgery, 
For two years, historians labored under the assumption that the letter and several companion forgeries were genuine. Now, I actually would like to see uh, the ways in which uh, they went about proving that was a forgery. But uh, I'll continue. In the wake of these events, the Prophet Joseph Smith's spiritual roots came under a careful scrutiny. Ironically, investigators soon brought to the surface a wealth of unquestionably genuine mater material, much of it long available but either misunderstood or ignored. Substantiating that the Smith, fam Smith and his family had a variety of interactions with non-Orthodox Western religious traditions generally termed occult. Repercussions from this difficult period in Mormon studies are still playing out. Cast into the realm of occult history, historians tried to make sense of this occult Joseph Smith and early Mormonism. The general interpretation eventually adopted by many investigators structured Joseph Smith's links to the occult within the sociological context of New England folk magic and its magic worldview. D. Michael Quinn's seminal study, Early Mormonism and the Magic Worldview, was initiated during this period. In his introduction, Quinn began by exercising the forgeries and summoning the facts. The historical issues these forgeries raise, this is Quinn, require, I believe, a careful reevaluation of evidence long in existence regarding early Mormonism and magic. Sources, whose authenticity are beyond question, provide evidence of Joseph Smith's participation in treasure digging, the possession and use of instruments and emblems of folk magic by Smith, his family members, and other early LDS leaders, the continued use of such implements for religious purposes in the establishment and early years of Mormonism, and the sincere belief of many early Mormons in the magic worldview. Hmm. Okay, subsequently, Quinn moved beyond these simple data. Indeed, comprehensive is hardly an adequate description of his survey. So, uh, yeah, it's fair to say Owens didn't quite agree with Quinn. Magical rituals, Kabbalah, Hermes Trismegistus, Rosicrucians, seer stones, divining rods, Masonic lore, and astrology. Quinn binds them all by evidence weak and strong to Joseph. Less integrative than extensive, his study is a foundation work which, as any study work should, leaves far more questions unresolved than answered. The subject broached by this effort demands further evaluation. A crucial correction, however, must be made to the methodology used in examining the data. The concept of a magic Weltanschung, or worldview, must be balanced with an intensive historical casting of early 19th century occultism, lineages, and mythos. Particularly important is a careful examination of Hermeticism and the nature of the religious vision it encouraged. <clears throat> and here comes the talented apologetic. Faced with a vast subject, Quinn constructed an arena for its study by circumscribing the concept of a magic worldview within the culture of early America, and then summoning the various facts that drew Joseph Smith and other early Mormons into that circle. The definition of magic came from Webster's Third International Dictionary, augmented and slightly expanded. Magic is, and not to quote the whole definition given by Quinn, I will abbreviate. The, quote, use of means that are believed to have supernatural power to cause a supernatural being to produce or prevent a particular result, unquote. The control of natural forces, quote, by the typically direct action of rights, objects, materials, or words, considered supernaturally powerful." Unquote. Later, Quinn adds that magic tends to incorporate that animistic worldview and a sense of a chain of causation behind event. 
Though it can be supplicative, its intent is often coercive. One is ill-advised to argue here with Quinn's general approach or definition of magic and its worldview, given the many constraints upon such a path-breaking investigation, both are well enough chosen. Nonetheless, their static, sociological, and philological correctness partially obscures a more complex process at play. Ah, uh, and I do want to remind you, I said that concerning the section on Hermeticism, that there would be a more expanded definition used concerning what is considered the use of magic, which I just read. That was one of the things that actually had bothered me about sort of an ideology of attaching the uh, Jesus name uh, part of the prayer onto everything, thinking that it is going to provide more or less power without thinking of whether it is actually the will of the one being prayed to that those things are done. It seems to me that depending on the people and the situation and the congregation, that oftentimes prayer is used in a more magical sense, unfortunately, than a sense of uh, communicating in a way that has been, I think, pretty clearly articulated uh, within the whole of Scripture, New and Old Testament, what we have at least currently canonized, in 66 books. Um, now, I don't think it's going to be necessary at this point in time to look more deeply into Quinn's work, although it sounds like it, it is worth its own uh, considerate uh, examination. But I can tell you that I, I have found a, a pretty comprehensive body of work from others um, some simply scholars, uh, others various apologists uh, on both sides, um, some more familiar with magic in the occult. And the consensus uh, that I've seen so far is that um, for sure that Joe Smith, his family, uh, so that's his parents, and who knows how far back that would go into parentage. And as was uh, easily admitted by Owens here, because uh, he doesn't tend to argue with it. In fact, he's going to, in my opinion, justify it. A number of the early uh, co-leaders with Smith. Remember, there's just no way I see any of this uh, coming about uh, purely from from just... Smith. There is, there's a lot to this. You're going to see this. Something that did strike me, though, since uh, Owens does bring up uh, philological uh, issues, is that I know that there is, uh, there's at least some decent, I doubt it's real extensive, uh, lexicography that Smith himself is said to have translated from those plates. Words that, uh, of course, you're not going to find in, in any lexicon of words in the Bible, uh, so-called Hebrew. What I suspect is, were I presented with, with a list of these, uh, these words that you can't find in uh, what's called the Old Testament, so they would be claimed to be Hebrew items that he transliterated into English. Uh, I would think that I would be able to take that list alone and see if it can be knocked down to its roots. Now I know we're actually we're talking about something that's again transliterated. So whenever you have a transliteration, you oftentimes it's they're very deceptive. Because, uh, first off, the Masoretic system of applying pronunciations based on what they say would be their, the invisible, non-existent vowel system, 
they they can do that and they have done that uh, it's either done by fiat or it's actually done by some kind of occulted system uh, in which what they were doing was actually generating their own code uh, on top of the uh, pure obri. So, because of that, transliterations from words that they have already gotten to and applied their uh, Masoretic Hebrew to, um, they can be a little bit difficult because phonetically they don't stay consistent. They never do. It's something you have to realize. Um, there is no consistency to their phonetics. But there's only so many different ways something can go because there's not too many sounds in Obri that overlap. The problem is in Masoretic Hebrew there's far more sounds, consonantal sounds, that overlap. And therein is a problem. They pick and choose however they want. However, I still think that I could be presented with a list of words and them in their basic context, so I understand how they're being used, and tell you whether or not those are even authentic items that should match up with Obri as a language. I think that would be telling. So now, Owens continues forward and writes, Magic came in many forms, high and low. As discussed earlier, in Europe, the medieval legacy of magic was transformed between the 15th and 17th centuries by an influx of the highly refined Kabbalistic, Hermetic, and alchemical traditions. During that time, magic became, at least for scholarly adherents like Pico di Merendola, uh, Giordano Bruno, and John Dee, it's a name that a lot of people would recognize, John Dee, something akin to a religion. In the Hermetic Kabbalistic interpretation, magic had more to do with obtaining experiential knowledge of God and the celestial hierarchies than the, with the particularistic goals of control and coercion, the, quote, digging for vulgar gold, unquote. And that may just be the overt forms of these things. Both Jewish and Christian practitioners of the high magical arts would have judged Webster's definition as applicable more to a reprehensible form of popular or folk magic than to their own pursuits. I don't know how you would get a Christian practitioner of magic. You can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one and despise the other or cling to the one and reject the other. So that's an impossibility. You can't be a Bible-believing magic practitioner. It doesn't work that way. Um, and that's the problem there. Really, that's probably shoots more to the core of problems we see herein than anything else. There, there is no duality of these things in, in Yahweh's world. In his sphere of law and statutes and judgments and the way that we are to conduct ourselves, there's no room for anything other than what he has prescribed. So, he, he continues, by the 17th century, this hermetic magic had become thoroughly intertwined with a wider reformative religious vision and a coherent <clears throat> foundational mythos. This view asserted the human potential for divine communication, progression to ultimate knowledge, and even union or identity with God. So now, in his continuation of his apologetic, in trying to separate what even he himself is uh, kind of uh, supporting, the sense that these sort of more refined uh, occult practices would have considered common magic vulgar. Remember the, uh, the quote from alchemy about vulgar gold. So he quotes a, uh, the historian Keith Thomas concerning a difference between uh, sort of a higher and lower magic. 
He said it, was, it would thus be tempting to explain the practice of popular magic as the reflection of the alchem alchemical and hermetic intellectual interests of contemporary scientists and philosophers, but such a claim of reasoning would almost certainly be mistaken. By this period, popular magic and intellectual magic were essentially two different activities, overlapping at certain points, but to a large extent carried on in virtual independence of each other. And essentially what we're seeing him draw a, a stark difference between in this section. Basically, uh, your con man gypsy magic and what would be considered, I guess to put it my way, uh, what I'm seeing coming through here is a type of more refined um, sort of magic worldview, which, uh, let's be 100% honest, this, this is not something that was, was spread around or proliferated to commoners, per se, um, the hoi polloi. This is definitely something that throughout the ages, uh, based on all of the names of the practitioners he ve he's even given so far, and who we can see historically being practitioners of it, and in our own day and age, those sorts of disciplines were definitely not being proliferated among the proletariat. Uh, this was definitely a bourgeoisie uh, type of thing, and you could separate them in that way. And it seems that Lance Owens, uh, you know, he takes offense, in a sense, to this, this lumping in. You can't just, he wants to, I think, very much uh, contradict the, uh, the man who wrote extensively on those excess letters that were found that could genuinely be attributed to Smith. Uh, you know, it's like he, he does. It, he takes offense and he wants to very clearly delineate these uh, differences between common magic and what I believe he is putting across as something far more divine and, in a sense, revelatory. Um, his last paragraph on the subject, he says, in summary, the treasure digger's magic worldview, the supernatural method to means, must be distinguished from the more complex hermetic vision conveyed in the mix of Kabbalah, ceremonial magic, paraclesian medicine, Rosicrucianism, alchemical symbolism, and several esoteric brands of masonry. And what a young Joseph Smith could have learned from a rodsman, ensconced only in a magic worldview, is less important to his religious development than the kinds of ideas a hermetic initiative might have stimulated. Now, it is in this subsequent section, Joseph Smith, Hermeticism, and Kabbalah, in which I think Owen's talents as an apologist, really shine through. Um, <clears throat> really, whether intentional or unintentional, the uh, the sheer amounts of sophistry and casuistry can't escape my attention. Uh, it's pretty obvious that this author has, for one thing, an extensive vocabulary. Not just the knowledge base, not just uh, well-researched in these particular areas. No, uh, he, uh, he has quite an extensive vocabulary as well. He is very well-educated uh, and very talented at writing. And something that I just want to, to point out, because it's been emerging, uh, I think, up until this point, it has been far more subtle, is his own dualistic nature as an apologist and as a writer. You're going to see that in just the first couple of paragraphs, which I will read uh, in total. 
so you can understand whether whether it is a talent and it is deliberate or whether like the argument he makes it's something that's uh just a natural outcropping of uh <laughs> the information he's handling it's definitely present it's definitely present and uh and this man is not speaking uh to the common lds reader he's not speaking to those people whose duty it is to pay your tithes and pay your taxes and roll up your sleeves and bend down and lift heavy weight i think he is far more writing to the adept reader <clears throat> so anyways he begins this section in the period before 1827, Joseph Smith probably had some passing interaction with individuals knowledgeable of Hermeticism and Kabbalah. But to reconstruct the history of that exposure demands consideration of contexts and hypotheses tied to a thin heritage of fact. It is a type of connection that appears likely, but which cannot be documented with certainty. The situation changes a bit after 1840. During those years of Joseph's life, evidences linking him to the Hermetic Kabbalic, Kabbalistic tradition can, when placed in context, appear substantial. In the following discussion, I will sketch some of the evidences linking Joseph to the Hermetic tradition, both early in his prophetic career and later in Nauvoo. And Though the shading of fact may seem too light or dark, or in proportions skewed, this is a way of drawing Joseph Smith within his own history that I believe must be confronted by Mormon historians. Of course, a question arises that lingers as a subtext to the material that follows and must be addressed before proceeding. If Joseph Smith had significant interactions with the Hermetic Kabbalistic mythos, did they impact his religion-making vision? While it seems to me that they probably would or did, I also acknowledge another possibility. Despite any apparent historical interaction, common patterns of connecting Smith's vision to the Hermetic Kabbalistic mythos may be entirely, entirely synchronous or parallel rather than causal, and if synchronous, they further could be classified as archetypal manifestations consistent with a recurrent type of revelatory experience, such as is witnessed elsewhere in the history of the tradition, or instead as pure happenstance. What Owens is thus able to do <clears throat> within the confines of this paper, uh, and which he further elucidates upon in the uh, subsequent paragraph, is a very cautious and careful dance between presenting these certainly occult ideas and sources, and in one way making them, um, presenting them in such a bold way as to seem to be either a casual denunciation uh, followed by a body of evidence that perhaps through various means of subtleties, makes them more palatable to the reader, um, and just continues to do this where, as he goes down the road, certain things in certain ways become more and more, how should I say, in a sense, making the occult seem to be more a commonplace spiritual experience 
and I think he has said as much, and I'm probably just going to have to read this next paragraph as verbose as it is, um, because one thing that I fear that I'm witnessing, and I hope others can uh, affirm this, is that there is the most uh, ingeniously subtle justification of a clear sort of uh, occult mindset and themes that when anyone can find them within the works of Smith, if you simply refer back to his apologetic in this paper, it might help to to soothe certain uh, instant sort of knee-jerk responses you would have. Um, I'll have to save any more commentary until after this. Again, verbose, but perhaps necessary to build on this case. So he writes, if one is inclined to look for links, deeper levels of complexity soon intrude. The hermetic Kabbalistic tradition not only affirmed the existence of an archetypal structure accessible to independent personal cognition or revelation, it sought through combined modalities of ritual, symbol, and myth to aid an individual's encounter with this core reality, a reality mirrored in the celestial realm and in the seeker's own self. I'm letting that sit. <laughs> Accepting that some individuals obtain these experiences, the question of causal versus synchronous links becomes circular. One can argue that contact with various hermetic ideas, symbols, ceremonies, and myths could, at least occasionally and in the properly predisposed individual, help invoke a numinous and uniquely individual experience. The experience, though personal and self-contained, might become the substratum for creative development of further in intuition and insights inherently present in the inciting mythos. Thus a tradition breeds an experience which then replicates anew the tradition. This whole issue recalls the question plaguing historical studies of Gnosticism and its various manifestations. Is the tradition conveyed through historically identifiable transmissions? Are various historical manifestations of Gnostic vision instead creations of a reborn and independent gnosis imbued with similar core insights? What depth psychology calls archetypal patterns? Or are both modes of transmission, inner and outer, intrinsically coupled? To these questions, I can give no answers. <laughs> I offer only my intuition that they lurk behind any interpretation of evidences linking Joseph Smith to Hermeticism. Now, I don't know that I believe that last question and answer. In fact, I believe what he goes about doing is embedding in the mind of the reader uh, a, a great deal of uh, evidence of a point of view that says that this is really what we would find concerning the occult and maybe specifically Kabbalah being of course the root here I mean he hasn't really made it a secret that there is this parental root to Kabbalah over and over again. Although uh, there may be more overt uh, vocabularies and manifestations in any of the, the subsequent disciplines down the line. Uh, again, there is this constant link back to the old world, specifically 
Jewish form of mysticism, grouping of uh, pseudopigraphical writings or pseudopigraphal, <laughs> pseudopigraphal writings, um, and uh, I don't actually know how many of the various other writings are non-pseudepigraphal. Though, as I said, and I don't know how much of an argument there is to be made on this, it is specifically Jewish. Occult and specifically Jewish. Going hand in hand along with uh, a number of other uh, unarguably religious Jewish writings, which all I see is it being uh, old world forms of paganism. And if we want to bring in other things like witchcraft, necromancy, wizardry, then so be it. I know that one thing that has to be working here is this preconceived notion that today's Jews are in fact the expression of yesterday's house of Judah, which of course cannot be proven neither by the Jews themselves nor by anyone else. Not at this point in time, and of course by fruit not at all whatsoever. So at this point, I think what this is going to help us do is to establish some questions and ideas that are, that are uh, of course, Owens doesn't answer, and I don't know that anybody has answered, but I think they're questions that we're going to have to at least answer in our own mind before we can continue past this fledgling organization and try to answer some questions beyond it, because there are questions to be answered beyond it. There is, of course, the, uh, the surface-level history, and I don't know how much of that anybody wants to believe. I think we can make judgment calls on a lot of the earlier traditions of what many people try to pass off as being factual or true, whether they are or not, and to what extent, I think we can use as a judge and a guide for actions that took place hereafter in the history of LDS, where they went, why, who were their associations, and so on and so forth. I'm going to go on to read what he has to say furthermore about Dr. Michael Quinn because the mere fact that he feels that he has to um, address this so strongly is telling. He uh, writes, Dr. Michael Quinn extensively details evidences of Joseph's early contact with Hermeticism, though he emphasizes the folk magical aspect. He offers the Smith family's carefully preserved magical parchments and dagger and the talisman Joseph carried on his person. One recognizes the prominence of the prominent use of Hebrew on both the parchments and talisman, although the reason for this has not been put in clear context by Mormon historians. The Hebrew came from Kabbalah. <laughs> As Quinn documents, knowledge necessary for the preparation of the Smith family magical implements could have been obtained from books of magic available in this time and region, and such materials might have been acquired specifically to aid magical activities associated with treasure seeking. <laughs> Preparation for and proper performance of a magical ritual including production of a ceremonial dagger or parchment, was, however, a lengthy and complicated venture demanding knowledge of an arcane vocabulary. The vast host of angels and spirits addressed in different magical rituals had specific names, 
again drawn from Kabbalah. Elaborate magical signs and varied functions within the natural and celestial hierarchies. From this complexity, magic lore made it clear that there were definite existential dangers in getting the details wrong. It thus seems likely that in addition to information gleaned from books, family members would have augmented their knowledge by associations with individuals experienced in ceremonial magic and the occult arts. In this company, Joseph Smith might have first been exposed to a person versed in the deep breadth of hermeticism. Guys, I don't know if I can even begin to unpack the mountain of telling information in that paragraph alone, or address the chagrin that I have that Owens is, uh, he's not even denying this. The fact that in the paragraph before this, uh, uh, Owens goes to great pains to, to really, though he asks and answers, uh, in my opinion, the, the, a question that is like a, a red flag uh, of casuistry being employed here. It's a very Talmudic type of casuistry here. He, 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 he makes an argument for something, and he definitely wants the reader to, to lock on to an ideology, but in a casuistic sort of way, right at the end there, g gives a sort of a way out. And then follows along <clears throat> by not, he's not just simply quoting Quinn, as in this is what Quinn claims. The fact is, he's making these things plain and clear, as though they're not arguable, but the oddest thing of them all, like considering the fact, you know, when I first read this and I saw, <laughs> I saw him just offering, um, the fact that the Smith family had carefully preserved magical parchments and a dagger. What do you think the dagger is used for in a magical ceremony? To cut bread? And the talisman Joseph carried on his person. One recognizes the prominent use of Hebrew on both the parchments and the talisman, although the reason for this has not been put in clear context by Mormon historians. Well, who needs them to put it in clear context? It's a fact that exists, and I think by the time we're done, we're going to have that in really clear context. And then he goes on to state again, not as, as something that's arguable, the Hebrew came from Kabbalah. And then, uh, just a couple other things, and I'm having a little trouble processing this. Um, he says, as Quinn documents, knowledgeable, uh, sorry, knowledge necessary for the preparation of the Smith family magical implements could have been obtained from books of magic available in this time and region. And such materials might have been acquired specifically to aid magical activities associated with treasure seeking. He's telling me this, the Smith family. So we're talking about his parents. We're not talking about, we're not talking about just books you could get in the 1820s. They were practitioners of such things. It's a family he came from. And of course, as far as I am aware, it is far beyond being rumor of his Masonic associations, that of his family. But he's trying to say that magical books were, were, were readily enough acquired? No kidding. Now, if that's the case, then we're talking about an atmosphere in New England in the early 1800s that was far different than, than, than what I had supposed it was. And I guess when you consider things like who it was that 
dominated, I mean, to say dominated is even unfair, they ran the slave trade, first off bringing whites here to languish away uh, and die on their Caribbean sugar plantations, but then also um, to, to, to build various portions of infrastructure along the eastern coastline of America. We're talking about people that were also, they were, and we, we know that, that this is not hard to argue or prove because they yet still are. Were the lords of vice in the early Americas. And of course, all of these activities being projected onto European whites. These people owned every single liquor distillery in Newport. Who do you think yet still runs the tobacco trade? All vice. They were the lords of vice. And this is where Kabbalah is coming from, and this, these magical... Uh, because it's just the old world witchcraft, wizardry, sorcery, necromancy, all the things disallowed by Yahweh in his law. But the idea that books on these subjects would have been so easily available, again, I have to tell you, I'm surprised. Now, I, I don't, I really don't think by any information that I've, I've ever seen that anybody's going to readily enough go to any sort of, of bookseller and be able to acquire something like this in the atmosphere of the early 1800s or the late 1700s in America, I would not think. I know, of course, that the the Freemasonry of uh, those people, so-called the Founding Fathers, and very influential and powerful people, it's just not really in question anymore. The, the biggest problem with sorting out the history of these days is because, well, they've been so successful in removing their part of the... Uh, of the doings and the happenings out of the equation. So was it so hard to get these books or wasn't it? Well, I don't know. But is he saying that Quinn is documenting that it is uh, or was, I'm sorry, easy to get such things? I mean, even in today's day and age, there is still some semblance of shame in, in such things, not in all areas. Um. The only problem is it's just some semblance. But then he would go on to say, and this is the other thing that, that should just surprise, I guess, uh, in light of, of the, the case that he just made in a paragraph or two before, as though this could be just a natural outcropping of, of these uh, Kabbalah, Hermeticism, uh, alchemy, various forms of Rosicrucian Freemasonic thought that that they they really are just the the couriers of of a higher uh, sort of spiritual cosmic tradition and and we can't say for sure that there was a clear Kabbalistic influence even in his early days in the early days of the people that were surrounding him as well because this is not a lone prophet not that I'm seeing. But tries to make a case that that there could just be this, uh, just, you know. Let's see if I can, just real quickly, the archetypal patterns, right? He he says it himself. It's, it's what depth psychology calls archetypal patterns. It's not necessarily that we can draw these clear clear connections to Kabbalah, and we don't even have to put the middlemen in between. Hermeticism, Rosicrucianism, right? Masonry, alchemy. We go straight to Kabbalah just based on some of these things that we've seen him just admit 
not even arguing with Quinn. I mean, he argues with Quinn about the difference between common and higher magic. This just admits. He says the vast host of angels and spirits addressed in different magical rituals had specific names. Again, drawn from Kabbalah. Elaborate magical signs varied functions within the natural and celestial hierarchies. From this complexity, magic lore made it clear that there were definite existential dangers in getting the details wrong. I'm sure there were. <clears throat> I'm sure there were. So I'm sure it's likely, he goes on to say, in addition to the information gleaned from books, family members, they would have augmented their knowledge by associations with individuals experienced in ceremonial magic because they just, how easy was it them f to, to find these people? Th these things don't happen in a vacuum. So look, uh, I got all these magic books, and uh, I'm not sure about the different, like the spirits and stuff that I've got to conjure. Ugh, I'm having some trouble pronouncing their names. I'm a little worried about my next magical ritual going right or not. So, um, I was going to go and just post an ad, uh, you know, down in the in local town square for anybody who is into some, some dark Kabbalistic magical rituals, you know, leave my phone number. Hopefully they'll give us a call, you know, before our next ritual, because we don't want, you know, that... It just doesn't work. They had to be already uh, saturated. Um, and you know, it's been my experience that the people who are practitioners of, of uh, these types of, uh, if you want to call them arts, uh, you know, they network. They do. You know, they don't tend to be islands, not not at all whatsoever. And, you know, they want Christians, they want people who believe and practice the Bible to be islands. They are not. They are connected. They are absolutely... Um, God, the words are escaping me. Networked. Okay, so he goes on to write that one individual that fits this description, the occult mentor, identified by Quinn, Dr. Lumen Walters, reputed to be a physician and magician. The two were sometimes closely associated in that age, he says. Walter is known to have been in Joseph's and his family's circles of acquaintances prior to 1827. He was also a distant cousin of Joseph's future wife, Emma Hale. As well, there's a coincidence. As Quinn notes, quote, Brigham Young described the unnamed New York magician as having traveled extensively through Europe to obtain profound learning, and others identified Walter as a physician who studied mesmerism in Europe before meeting Joseph Smith. The Walter family records and legends call him clairvoyant. If these statements are generally accurate, Walter had considerable knowledge of hermetic traditions. During his period in Europe, and to a lesser degree in America, a physician with interests in mesmer, magic, clairvoyance, and profound learning, in quotes, moved in a milieu nurtured by the legacies of Hermeticism. By definition, such a physician stood in a tradition dominated by the medical and esoteric writings of Paracelsus, steeped in alchemy and associated closely with Rosicrucian philosophy. As an individual also interested in hidden treasures, Walter might have taken particular note of Paracelsus' admonition on Kabbalah's import. And here it is. All of you who see land beyond the horizon, who read sealed, hidden missives 
and books, who seek for buried treasures in the earth and in walls, you who teach so much wisdom, such high arts, remember that you must take unto yourselves the teachings of the Kabbalah, if you want to accomplish all of this. For the Kabbalah builds on a true foundation. Pray, and it will be given you. Knock, and you will be heard. The gate will be opened to you. Everything you desire will flow and be granted you. You will see into the greatest depth of the earth. The art of the Kabbalah is beholden to God. It is in alliance with Him. It is founded on the words of Christ. But if you do not follow the true doctrine of Kabbalah, but slip into geomancy, you will be led by the spirit which tells you nothing but lies. Now, I must ask, this begs the question, why did Owens go to such lengths earlier, as if he was insulted personally? To distinguish between this common treasure-seeking magic and all of these so-called higher forms and expressions thereof, which, of course, he readily admits, all have their core in Kabbalah. I mean, if you paid attention to what I just read, <laughs> Paracelsius is telling everybody, treasure seekers, you want to do it right, you need to pay attention to Kabbalah. Hmm. If Walter did have contact with the young smith, Owens continues, he might have shared some interesting ideas about the occult reformative tradition that had for three centuries been a force working on the creative edge of the Western religious imagination, concepts which might have had influenced a prophetic imagination. Oh, there we go again. It is, uh, of course, these influences on the young and influential Smith. But here's what I have to ask, and this is the question again and again. If this man is a true prophet who heralded in true practice of the true God, and we're saying this is the same God of Israel, the God of the Old and New Testaments, that God, Are you telling me that it would be a, a natural thing for his, oh, whether they be acquired or, or, or what? And I don't think he wants to sell us on it being acquired. Uh, he definitely wants to sell us on the fact that it is this, of course, this natural outcropping. Um course, as he stated earlier, <clears throat> that it was archetypal patterns, remember. Just a natural thing. These are archetypal patterns. Here is the tentative early connection to a legacy of ancient priesthoods, lost books, sacred weddings, modern seers, co-eternal matter, golden treasuries, angelic messengers, rebuilt temples, dawning dispensation, and God's glorious intelligence. Perhaps Walter might have had something to say about the story of the 16-year-old Christian Rosenkreutz, who journeyed to the East and translated the book M, only to be rejected by the learned of his age. This was a legacy of ideas about man and God, unlike anything in the texts of revivalism and seekerism sweeping New York's burned-over district, and yet so much like the religion embraced by the prophet-to-be. So then Owens goes on for a few more paragraphs that I'm not going to read, the, uh, the documents available in every one of the videos, but he does go on to say, to cite, actually, the citations of Quinn, as far as, first off, areas of Pennsylvania being like the nexus of all kinds of odd occult activity. 
amongst these certain areas of Pennsylvania that were known from at least the 17, the early, like turn of the, uh, of the century, 1700. Time, occultists from Europe had been coming over and congregating in these certain areas. You see what I just said about the Smith family? They're not an island, okay? No occultist is. They congregate. They network. What is so mind-blowing to me? Okay, and by the way, and then it's of course admitted that Smith himself had journeyed to these uh, uh, heavily occulted places. And I don't mean hidden places. <laughs> Heavy with, with the occult, people practicing hermeticism and, and Kabbalah and all kinds of these <clears throat> various uh, uh, occult rituals and disciplines. That, that eight years even before he was said to have trans, translated any of these plates, uh, the book of Nephi, he's, he's, he's traveling and spending time in these places and with these people. But then yet in some kind of, uh, uh, some kind of a split personality way, Owens goes back to, to almost to backtrack terribly and say something like, well, if, if young Joseph Smith Jr., and maybe he had a passing conversation with uh, Walters that he mentioned earlier, this, this doctor into all kinds of dark stuff. Maybe during a conversation, some of this stuff slipped out. I mean, it's, it's getting pretty insulting now. And, and that's why, of course, uh, I'm approaching him with less respect, because there is a, there is a degree of insult to the reader by ping-ponging back and forth like this. You know, to go on, uh, to go on after this and make statements um, like, for instance, uh, he said Joseph Smith's possible direct exposure to Kabbalah before 1840 deserves specific comment, and I will later discuss this in detail in his studies in Nauvoo. The role of Kabbalah in magic was pervasive enough that even with a curtailed involvement in ceremonial magic, Smith would have heard of the subject. And I have to add, well, wait, didn't six paragraphs earlier, you readily admitted to what had been documented by Quinn concerning the parchments, the dagger, the talisman which Smith wore on his person, having the Hebrew on it, which was specifically from Kabbalah. And now he's going to say that the role of Kabbalah was pervasive enough that even with curtailed involvement... In ceremonial magic, Smith would have heard of the subject, would have heard of it. Come on, man. Oh, he's wearing a talisman with Hebrew on it that specifically is from the Kabbalah terminology. But yeah, I, I would imagine uh, that he probably heard a subject uh, at that point, even with the limited amount of ceremonial magic that he and his family was into. Man, sell it to somebody dumber. Um, all right. And then just to get to pretty much uh, wrapping this section. Okay, so I'm only going to point out a couple of more things uh, and then try to just try to wrap. So with everything we've seen so far, again, um, a bit of a split personality uh, ping pong match between the obvious and admission, and then uh, the uh, the talented apologist comes forth with the clear admission of the ceremonial magic they were into, the items they had that contained Hebrew that were specifically from Kabbalah, um. And the influences that they had, the people that the Smith family knew, these and these were not uh, the, the sort of common, uneducated folk. They were very well traveled, very well educated, and very well educated in these various occult, dark disciplines. However, um, he's going to make an argument that, well, but in general, 
Uh, even the person that uh, was acquainted with, say, uh, Christian Kabbalah, that would have been probably the thing that people would have been most acquainted with. They, they, they would have a hard time, though, because they would only be acquainted with certain uh, idioms and, uh, and more overt uh, ideologies within Christian Kabbalah, not very deep. And, uh, and not too many of them would have been able to have much access to Kabbalah because so much of it would have been in the original Hebrew. Um, of course, I was pretty sure he said that uh, various copies of the Zohar had been made in, in Latin and other languages. Um, but uh, somehow the Smith family, which certainly sounds quite educated to me, and their friendships, acquaintances and connections seem pretty educated to me and also educated in the uh, cult and pretty familiar I would say with Kabbalah they had these uh, items even in their home that they were using for ceremonial magic a talisman he wore on his person with Hebrew from Kabbalah now if everything was so remember he he's, he's readily admitting this too that the disciplines of this ceremonial magic required that somebody knew, for instance, names of these celestial beings, so they want to call them, with a perfectness. So important, so that if you weren't all that familiar with it, you would definitely want to find somebody who was. That could help you along. But somehow or another, we're led to believe that they would not have an understanding of what the Kabbalah was saying in its original Hebrew, even if that was the only sort of copy or translation that they had. He goes on to say, and this is where he's trying to make his argument, that he would have, in general, been ignorant of Kabbalah. He goes on to say the most basic form available to him would have been simple representations of the tree of Sephiroth, found in hermetic works published in the 17th and 18th century. That tree of Sephiroth is a very, very predominant uh, visual figure in Kabbalah and is utterly specifically Kabbalistic. He says this depiction, uh, depiction of the Sephiroth alone could have conveyed a wealth of ideas about the uh, emanational structure of divine life, ideas which perfused hermetic ideas and symbols, and which were like those developed in Mormon theology. Huh, go figure. The power of this archetypal pattern of the Sephiroth to stimulate a religious imagination is witnessed by occasional later Christian Kabbalistic works, some of which appeared to be almost entirely free associations built from meditations on this structure of the Sephiroth and devoid of any relation to traditional Jewish or Christian Kabbalistic commentaries. So again, we're going to be um, an apologist for that archetypal form. Um, boy, I'll tell you something. If you're not sharp and... Uh, and admittedly, admittedly, I am just barely sharp enough to follow the movements of this guy throughout this document. I've got to tell you, um, this guy as an intellect is far beyond me. And I have to read and reread this stuff um, to, to really hang on to this roller coaster ride um, of wordsmithing. Uh, and, and as I said, it's sort of like ping-ponging ideologies uh, that, he's, that, he's, that he's throwing down here. And this guy, he's so, he's so intelligent, this, this author, Owens, I, I'd be hard-pressed to believe it was accidental. Now, just the, the last paragraph... Um, in this section, well, it better be in this section. I, I want to double check before I say something really dumb. I always like to double check before I say something really dumb. All right, so anyways, it is. And he says uh, in this last paragraph, in this vein, a work recently published by Mormon author Joe Samson is interesting. Samson evaluated Joseph Smith's writing, including the Book of Mormon and Doctrine and Covenants, 
and noted a pattern of word and concept usage in several verses which reproduces both the common English names and the general hierarchical structure of the Kabbalistic tree of Sephiroth. While Samson carries his argument beyond what a less intuitive student might discern, several of his examples deserve consideration, and though this Kabbalistic pattern in Smith's revelatory writings may be accidental, yeah, it may be accidental, I just can't take it anymore. It also could suggest some earlier exposure at least to the concept of the Tree of Sephiroth. And exposure in what way? He saw it on the good Dr. Walter's book, because he left the book out while he was having very limited contact with Smith and his family. There is just a, there is a, because he's not, this author is not dumb. He's not, he's not, he's not. Uh, Samson extends his thesis by suggesting that Smith's translation of the Book of Abraham from the Egyptian Pyrus was a Kabbalistic work in the classic sense. Though Samson's development of this argument is itself cryptically Kabbalistic, well, his name is Samson, this theme again deserves scrutiny. Kabbalah was, as he notes, the tradition of prophetic interpretation. It encouraged a creative rendering of sacred texts and the quest for a return to the primary vision which was the single source of knowledge and scripture. In nature, if not in context, Smith's translation of the Book of Mormon, his retranslation of Genesis, and his interpretation of the Book of Abraham papyruses all can be seen as expressions of the primary interpretive vision Kabbalah mandated from prophetic consciousness. Whether this was a reflection of Joseph's contact with Kabbalah or just of Joseph remains an open question. But beyond doubt this interpretive activity fits within the evolved hermetic Kabbalistic vision of a true prophet's work. Unbelievable. Okay folks, so that's those two sections. Uh, you know, I really don't think that I'm misrepresenting the information here. And, and of course, it's, it's why, if I'm going to go through documents like this, uh, I'm going to post them, uh, let you read it for yourself. Uh, those who think I'm mistaken um, can think I'm mistaken. Uh, bring it to me, you know, in the form of comments. Um, try not to uh, write me documents uh, in email or anything, uh, you know, unless there's something I missed that has uh, something specifically to do with this. Now, I don't have the time to go through some real major documents here, and and I, I have no idea uh, no intention of making specifically Mormonism where the, the documents or letters or just anything that, that Smith wrote um, to become any kind of main focus. My, my main focuses are still as, as they've always been. However, this is, as I already stated, there, there wasn't the intention to spend the time with this, but as I read through the second time, and it start, I started to absorb the import of so many of those steps that Owens was taking in getting to the finality of this document. I began to see that they, they couldn't just be skipped over entirely. Uh, and so again, I... I really recommend anybody who can to just put the time into reading this, put the time into it. Um, you know, I don't have perfect powers of deduction, uh, but uh, I'm also not the dullest tool in the shed either. And to try to draw a picture that we've seen drawn so many times, and we... 
I think could be both those of us who have had very little experience with Mormonism and and those of us who who have well let's say have been raised in the Mormon church or have had more experience with it we're we're still getting the same uh narrative meant for the goy I think uh wherein uh you have uh, more of a lone uh certainly misunderstood prophet and the one thing that, uh, even with my, my limited uh, deductive uh, facilities, I can tell you that when you, for instance, when you read the books of the prophets in what's called the Old Testament, one thing you are going to see is a consistency of voice. Now, there are those out there who would swear up and down that they're seeing a consistency of voice as well. Now, I would have to ask a counter uh, question to that assertion, which would be, is it a consistency of voice, or is it um, a relative concurrence with certain ideologies expressed in what's called the Old Testament is uh, is it actually just a repetition of archetypal forms pulled from a knowledge of the Old Testament I would have a hard time believing anybody would be an adept in Kabbalah and not have an understanding also of the Old and New Testaments since this author readily admits that what we're looking at in Kabbalah uh, strangely similar to what we would see in the Mishnah and Talmud is more of a commentary on Scripture um, than its own you know intrinsic original work and that's that that makes all the sense in the world because that's typically what we see with all of these occult disciplines and it just stands to reason if you're going to contrive uh, uh, any new religion, let's say, uh, new philosophical worldview that, that at least has adherence to it, if you're going to uh, completely contrive it, uh, let's put this in the context of, say, an L. Ron Hubbard uh, Dianetics Spaceman context, okay? You're going to get far, far, far less adherence than you are going to if it, we're simply talking about a uh, an expanded, a further, or a deeper expression of interpretation of something um, so readily accepted as the Bible, especially by the elect people. You, you have far more hope of finding uh, a soil that you can work in than the other. So uh, I see, I see a, a, an amazingly clear picture of a man who himself and his family, uh, in my opinion, and based on what I've read herein, were steeped in Kabbalistic lore and practice before um, he was ever said to have translated. Uh, this book of Nephi and then so forth uh, I don't think it does us any good to ignore the uh, the statements made by this Joe Sampson either if the man purports to uh, have found a word pattern now this this is really important because when you write and I can tell you this from the standpoint of a writer when you write You've got fingerprints. They 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 are transferred to your writing, uh, uh, just as sure as the ridges uh, on your finger will transfer to a piece of paper. Should you apply ink and and transfer it, the things in your mind, um, in writing, can't easily be hidden. Um, 
your Weltanschauung, your spiritual condition, you see. Th that alone has been for me over the years one of the greatest proofs concerning the divinity of Scripture is the consistency of voice throughout all of these books written by different men over many, 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 many centuries of time. Except maybe in Esther. I don't see that consistency of voice. Uh, Esther, of course, the foundation of uh, one of the most celebrated Jewish holidays, being Purim, where they fantasize about robbing, stealing, and killing from all of us who they call Goyim. And hey, you know what? If they really understood, and if all of us really understood what uh, Goy and Goyim is, the nations, <laughs> and who that that would be referring to but of course they don't they twist everything all of their terminology is utterly twisted um, so I think this is great foundations for where we're going to have to go from here after and not only in this document but forward uh, so thank you for joining me and we'll see you next time